All right. Um, so, um, welcome everyone. Um, we um, now present um, some other applications of the WGCNAR package. Um, so, I will talk about several topics um, that haven't been touched upon yet. One is meta analysis, the other is differential network analysis. So, um, today I will talk about some tools for carrying out a, what I call standard differential expression analysis. Think t tests, fold changes, and so on. And then I will spend a couple of minutes on statistical power studies. Why? Because uh, you often want to know, well, how many samples do I need? Then I will review important network concepts or network statistics. Um, and then we describe um, different analysis strategies, um, for example, single network analysis versus differential network analysis. All right. So let me start out with what I refer to as standard differential expression analysis. Um, so what it, why do I call it standard? Well, because it's a gene-based analysis, right? So you look at one gene at a time. Um, as opposed to looking at a module or a gene set. In this sense, it's standard. And um, there are, of course, wonderful software packages out there for calculating uh, student t-tests or p-values. And then you may ha um, have heard of um, false discovery rates um, or, or q-values and fold changes and so on. And um, in this course, of course, um, our focus is on network analysis tools, but I hope um, you don't walk away from this course thinking that you don't have to do a standard analysis as well. You know, Example, if you study Alzheimer's disease and you have um, diseased um, samples and control samples, let's say brain tissue samples, then yes, I think um, you have noticed that uh, WGCNA can be very valuable for finding Alzheimer-related modules. However, in a paper, you would certainly want to write a section which um, would be headed by something like standard differential expression analysis. Why? Because um, the reader of your paper will certainly be interested to uh, find out, well, so what are the most differentially expressed genes? And um, um, if you, um, uh, so we also provide some R functions um, um, and with the following names, standard screening binary trait. So what does that do? Well, if you have a binary trait, for example, disease status, yes or no, then you can apply the standard screening binary trait function and it will output pretty much any statistic that um, some of my collaborators have ever asked me for. Some collaborators want just a student t-test and a p-value and a q-value. Others want a fold change. Others want the area under the ROC curve that every gene produces. These are the people who um, um, work on prediction tasks and they just want to know, well, for each gene, what is the area under the ROC curve that it could predict? Um, so, so, in any event, this um, and also the function outputs things like the mean value in each group. For each gene, it would say the mean expression value in Alzheimer's disease patients is that, and the uh, this, uh, mean value in control samples is that. You know? So often I take the output from standard screening binary trait and export it into an Excel spreadsheet, and this is then supplementary table number one in my scientific paper. You know? And because I, I need to tell the reviewers or, or the readers of the paper, if you want to find out what are the most important genes and you want to know their Q values, supplementary table one. You know. It's not a main table because it simply is too large. You know. <laughs> yes? Yes. So the question is, can I... Um, um, uh, uh, um, carry out the analysis in specific brain regions. So yes, of, absolutely. So for example, you would restrict attention to hippocampal samples and just then um, find th the genes in the hippocampal region that differ between AD subjects and controls. 
Absolutely. You know. Now, um, let's now assume you don't have a binary variable, but you have a numeric trait, for example, body weight, mouse body weight, or HDL levels, or something like that. Then again, it can be very interesting to know, well, so what are the genes that have the highest correlations with that um, numeric variable? And um, to screen all your 50,000 transcripts, you can use the R, func uh, R function standard screening numeric trait, you know, and it does, again, it outputs pretty much any measure that your collaborators can ask you for, the correlation value, the p-value, the q-value. Um, I should mention um, the q-value um, is based, uh, is calculated using the q-value R package, you know, so it's, um, I'm totally blanking on the author. Um, for, uh, do, you, do you know? Story. Story. Story, thank you. Thank you for saving me that embarrassment. But um, 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 Dr. Story created a very useful um, R function and R package called Q value. And in order to um, um, provide uh, user friendliness, we, we draw on it, you know, in that package. And finally, I mentioned there's some of you who have, uh, who often analyze cancer data sets. Um, and in cancer, you often want to know um, survival time, cancer survival time, or cancer recurrence time. And so these outcome data are so-called censored time variables. And um, again, there is a, a, a function called standard screening sensor time and it outputs a lot of um, the output you would get from running a Cox regression model for each individual gene. So just to be clear, the out, um, so let's say you have cancer survival time and you use a Cox model to regress um, uh, survival time on one gene expression level at a time. Then um, you get the um, 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 output such as um, Cox regression p-values, hazard rates. Um, you also again can calculate the concordance index, also known as C index, also known as area under the ROC curve, um, tailor-made for um, sensor time variables. And so again this function outputs it. All right, um, another thing I would like to highlight is the following that um, often, well, let's um, start here. So um, these, these standard functions are applied to one data set. But sometimes you're in the fortunate situation that you have multiple data sets, right? If you study Alzheimer's disease, you may have multiple brain data sets. Um, or you could have different brain regions. And you could say, well, <laughs> find genes that are consistently <coughs> differentially expressed across multiple data sets. And to do that, there's another R function in the WGCNA package called meta-analysis. Uh, so meta-analysis is a broad term referring to integrating multiple data sets. And um, just to um, show you some excerpt from the help file of the meta-analysis function. So the input is um, the usual multi-expression set. Do you remember we learned that um, in the context of module preservation analysis and consensus network analysis? So multi-expression is a list with multiple components. So these could be now several Alzheimer's disease data sets. And also you input analogously a list of what we call multi-traits. So that's a list that would report disease status, for example, for each of the different uh, data sets. And there are various options and so what does the function do? For one thing it outputs a STUFA Z statistics based meta-analysis statistics. So um, I'm not going too much into it but um, the STUFA method is to turn, um, so for each uh, sorry, for each data set and for each gene, you calculate the Z statistic um, or, or related to a student t-test statistic. So you have now for each data set a Z statistic and you in essence form an, an, an average of that, except that it isn't precisely an average. Now, 
Um, why? Because let's say you have three data sets, then you sum the three Z statistic and divide by the square root of three, not by three. That's uh, the Stufa idea. Now, um, the one choice you need to think of is how you um, um, weigh different data sets. Right? It could be that your first data set contains 300 subjects, whereas the second data set only 50, and so on. And so um, to deal with that, um, the meta-analysis function outputs actually all statistics. One is where you weigh each data set equally, and therefore it's called, the output is called z dot equal weights. That's the meta-analysis z statistic. Now for it, it also outputs then the corresponding p-value. And then it calculates the corresponding um, Q value. Um, however, there are some papers that argue that you shouldn't put all the data on the same footing. And therefore, you should use the square root of the sample size. And so, therefore, the output is referred to as root of the degrees of freedom. And, um, and then there are other papers that say don't use the square root, but just use <laughs> the, the number. And so you get these three output, outputs corresponding to different weightings. That's one thing I should mention. I should also mention the function allows you to input your own weightings. If for some reason you feel this one data set has lower quality, I want to downweigh it, you can do that in the R function. So the Stufa Z statistics are very valuable. Uh, we and others use them all the time for integrating multiple data sets. I do want to mention there's a second output. So um, just to be clear, when we, calculate, uh, when we created this meta-analysis function, the goal was to integrate or, uh, and to provide as many meta-analysis statistics as anyone can ask for. You know because the, um, we always want to make our own lives easier. So I would like to um, give my collaborator everything they can possibly ask for so that they don't come back, you know, because I rather say in an email, go to column number 16 of the output file, if, you know, because they may say, you know, I didn't like uh, the results for equal weights. I should have chosen the um, degrees of freedom differently. And so I just say it's all there, you know. But in any event, so let's say they, uh, your collaborators say, you know, I'm not comfortable with the Stufa statistic. I would rather do another approach. And that is implemented as well. So these are ranking-based meta-analysis statistics. So what is that? So imagine that people have, um, imagine they don't want to integrate um, the data at the level of Z statistics but rather they want to simply rank the genes according to the Z statistics. Do you see? They say this is the most significant gene, this is the second most significant gene, this is the least significant gene. But you could also rank according to the sign. So if you have a Z statistic of 20, that's the highest ranking one, or the Z statistic of minus 20 is the lowest ranking one. So then from each data set, you get a ranking of the genes. Let's say you have five different Alzheimer's disease data sets, you get five rankings. And now you would like to integrate the rankings and just find the genes that consistently rank highly. And that is accomplished with these outputs. Um, so there's something called p-value low rank. So if that p-value is significant, let's, uh, or very, uh, very significant, then uh, it corresponds to a gene that ranks lowly consistently across the data set, never mind what the z-statistic was. And similarly, there's a p-value high rank, you know, and so again, that uh, gets you these genes. And you notice there's a lot of output and it corresponds to different weightings. Again, do you want to weigh each data set equally or do you want to weigh it by um, the sample sizes? Um, apart from the p-values, we also output corresponding q-values. And so that would allow you to report all the genes that, have consi that rank consistently in a low fashion um, at a q-value threshold of 0.05, you know. All right. Um, 
In that context, let me mention that the meta-analysis function is a wrapper function. And um, um, it includes this rank p-value function. And um, I, I do want to um, briefly mention the rank p-value function because I found it quite useful in several applications. So what is that? So let's say, again, you have different rankings based on um, any statistic. It could be a fold change. So you have five data sets and from each data set you calculate a fold change statistic and which allows you then to rank your 50,000 genes. And so you have these five rankings and same question I mentioned. You just want to find the genes that have um, that rank highly in terms of their fold change across all the five data sets. Then the rank p-value function outputs p-values for that, do you see? It's very valuable because what's the alternative? See, typically people have, um, would do this. They say, give me the 100 genes with the highest ranking in the first data set. Give me another 100 genes with the highest ranking in the second data set. Intersect them. Then you end up with 30 that are intersecting. Then it says, okay, now give me the 100 genes from the third data set, intersect it again, and you're down to, and then, then you end up with 10 genes, and so on. The problem is if you do that exercise based on thresholds, you, after five data sets, you may end up with zero. Why? Because there's an artificial threshold of 100. Why didn't you choose 200, you know? <laughs> So the rank p-value function has the same logic. It uses rankings, but it frees you up from the threshold. Instead, it outputs a p-value and a q-value, which you then can threshold and say, give me everything that ranked highly based on a q-value threshold, or give me anything that consistently ranked lowly. Now, the one thing I should um, mention here, the rank p-value function, um, outputs two types of statistics. Let me show you that. If you carefully read, there is, um, do you notice, um, there is um, this, um, in the output, it says rank. And so it means it literally is based on rankings. Um, but there is another a type of statistic based, uh, called scale statistic, that, which you may, uh, see. And um, what it does is, it again um, um, is based on rankings, however it scales the rankings and then uses um, the um, law of large numbers to calculate a p-value. So um, the rank statistics, um, the rank p-value function calculates two types of p-values. One is based on using the unif uh, a convolution of uniform distributions and the other uses um, the law of large numbers. So to t just be aware of it, you know. And in the help file I give you citations and way more comments, but I just want to highlight that. Um, if you want to be conservative, you use the rank-based approach. It's more rigorous. However, we often find that the scale-based rank statistics are far more significant and um, they, um, so if you have a large number of data sets, uh, sufficiently large, so, so that you can argue that the law of large, uh, the central limit theorem applies, that's what I should have said, central limit theorem is the right term, then, um, then you should use the scale function. All right, um, let me now switch gear and um, come to another practical um, topic which are statistical power studies. And of course, there are wonderful software packages for calculating sample sizes. But I will just um, show you one paper which, um, which makes me smile every time I look at it. So <laughs> there's a paper published by Jacob Cohen, which was called a power primer. And it, notice it was uh, published under quantitative methods in psychology. Just a, a little paper on power studies. Now, the reason why I smile about it is because it was cited by over 11,000 articles, right? <laughs> so 
So why do we work for years on methods papers if you produce a little <laughs> paper on power studies, you know, and you get 11,000 citations, you know. So, <laughs> but why was it cited so highly? Because Cohen, of course, was one of the first ones who emphasized how critical it is to report um, power um, results when you report a negative finding, right? You say, I find no significant difference, and he emphasized, well, then tell us what was the power of the study. But in any event, it's a classic paper, and um, it contains these tables that everyone refers to. So let me give you some excerpts. So in table one of this paper, he um, reports several tests. For example, in the first row, you see the test for <coughs> comparing two means. There is a group A and a group B, Alzheimer's disease patients versus controls. And then, um, assuming that there's a certain effect size um, measured by the difference in means divided by the standard deviation, you can, he then um, um, specified what he calls a small effect size, a medium effect size, and a large effect size. And, of course, the statisticians in the room will probably argue with them. They will say, well, this is not really large, this is a small one, or whatever. But let's just say, um, I think one of the values of this paper was that it told psychologists and applied users what a statistician considers to be a large effect or a small effect. And, okay, so that's test number one, just comparing means. Um, maybe could you close it door? Yeah, um, comparing means. And for every effect size, then, you can look up required sample sizes at different um, um, alpha levels. And because this, um, he had um, psychological applications in mind, he chose alpha levels 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and so on, which of course don't apply in genomics, except perhaps if you deal with module eigengenes, you know. It, it actually happens that in some applications we end up with five module eigengenes. And so arguably you could then say, well, I get away with a alpha level of 0 0.01. But so let's look at the sample sizes then. So he says if you have um, a large effect, si effect size, then to compare two means, you need 38 samples. You know? I think it's per group actually, or I forgot. I, one needs to carefully read it. You know? Now, in, if you tell this to your collaborator, create 38 samples uh, using RNA-seq data, they will just roll their eyes, you know, and <laughs> stop the conversation. Which comes back to this discussion, what is a large effect size? In my opinion, this is not a large effect size for gene expression data, you know. Um, in any event, so here you go. Um, I report these power studies because I want to make a different point, um, which is um, that you need different sample sizes for different statistical tests. Um, let's look at the second test then, so, um, which is estimating a correlation coefficient accurately. And remember, for WGCNA, we want to ca estimate ca um, correlation coefficients accurately. So. Um, Again, th what he calls a small effect size is a correlation of 0.1. A large <coughs> effect size is a correlation of 0.5. In WGCNA, I would um, probably call a correlation of 0.5 a moderate correlation. Because often we find that genes are highly correlated, 0.9, uh, no, you know. And so, so in this sense, this table doesn't completely apply. However, what we learn is, if you want to estimate correlation co coefficients as large as 0 0.5, uh, 0.5, you need a sample size of um, 41 if you want an alpha level of 0 0.01, and 28 if you want an alpha level of 0 0.05. So based on these types of findings, um, I always tell people that I I like to apply WGCNA if you have a sample size of 30 total. And I can live with it if your sample size is 20 arrays. But um, I'm really uncomfortable going below that sample size. Why? Because then you just cannot estimate um, correlations accurately. You know? 
Um, all right, but now comes the whole gist of this um, PowerPoint slide, which is a different um, analysis. So imagine you have two correlation coefficients. You have a correlation coefficient in Alzheimer's disease patients, and you have a corresponding correlation coefficient in control subjects. And you want to test for a difference in these correlation coefficients. Now, in this case, whatever he calls an effect size, a large, medium, large, um, or small effect size, notice the sample sizes are drastically higher. Uh, double, basically, you know. And so, um, so there is a take-home message. When you um, do what we call differential network analysis, or where you really compare differences in correlations, you need a much larger data, a sample size. You know? Um, now later I show you some strategies for doing differential network analysis, but be aware of it. I, I feel if you have two networks, one based on 20 um, subjects, the other again based on 20 subjects, and then you do a differential network analysis, I'm, I'm really nervous about that, you know, because of the sample size. However, I can live with it if you do a module preservation analysis because the module preservation analysis aggregates these statistics across dozens or hundreds of module genes so I'm more comfortable with that you know are there any questions or comments at this point yeah. yes yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. Because so, you have genes that appear to be highly correlated in their patterns, but really that's only because of the leverage of certain um, samples being very high, et cetera, Yes, right? yes. And then that gets all transferred downstream into the network methodology, but it's not for the network methodology's fault either. Yes, so the, you, you so the comment is um, really um, when you compare two correlations, you know, you need to really be careful about um, making sure that the samples are comparable. I think that, that's, you know, um, because uh, yes, in one data set you may have some samples that um, induce a very large correlation pattern by virtue of um, having genes that are highly overexpressed in it, you know. Um, where, and so, so I completely agree with it. You, uh, you need, when, whenever you do differential network analysis, um, you um, ver have to very carefully think about what are you comparing. All right, um, let me move to another topic. Um, so we alluded to it several times, but now it becomes very relevant. So let's review some network concepts and network statistics, which is the same thing. So just to br briefly remind you, a network is of course specified by an adjacency matrix, and um, which is a symmetric matrix, and the, uh, the elements are either um, quantitative numbers, real numbers, then you have a weighted network, and um, binary entries if you have an unweighted network. And um, so let's look at a motivational example. So here we are back to the mouse data from Jake Luces's lab, where we have different gender tissue combinations, female liver, male liver, um, um, female adipose tissue, then brain tissue, muscle tissue. And um, what you see is there are different hierarchical cluster trees, and they look ugly, right? <laughs> um, and, um, but in any event, uh, they look, why do they look ugly? Because you don't have distinct branches. So it tells you immediately module detection is difficult, the branch cutting is difficult. Um, but another way to visualize the data is to show the underlying correlation matrix in this heat map, right? 
And so what you see is um, some genes are highly correlated. You see a red dot, others are, have negative correlations which correspond to green dots. And um, so a challenge is then to develop simple descriptive measures for describing these patterns, right? It would be nice to have a statistic that highlights that this looks very different from that, you know. And um, so that's um, a motivation for developing different network concepts and I will review them shortly. But yesterday I already mentioned there's a network concept called density which me measures the density of connections, you know. Let me give you another motivational example. So um, imagine you have a gene significance measure. For example, for each gene it reports the correlation with mouse body weight. And so um, here I plot the gene significance measure on the y-axis and a measure of um, connectivity, for example intramodular connectivity, on the x-axis. And what do we see? Well, in the female uh, liver tissue we find a strong relationship which indicates that hub genes relate to mouse body weight. They have high significance. Now in other um, gender and tissue combinations I don't observe it. For example, they, there's no relationship between um, gene significance and connectivity in the brain tissue sample, which makes sense. Why would the brain expression matter for b mouse body weight, you know? Um, but in any event, so the, the statistical challenge is, well, how do you measure what we call hub gene significance, right? Because here, in the female liver uh, example, the hub genes are significant for your application of interest, whereas in the brain, hub genes are not important. And um, just to give you the answer already, there is a network concept called hub gene significance and it is really just the slope of this line. So we have a, um, a, a line that is not a regression line. It, it is a line um, that is forced to pass through the um, origin, meaning the point zero zero. But then it's a, so it's a regression without intercept term. And then the slope of that line, that's called hub gene significance. So um, these network concepts um, are also known as network indices and so on and um, they really underlie um, the language used in systems biological modeling. As, I mean the most um, widely used term is hub gene and it's um, based on connectivity, right? But there are really dozens of potentially useful uh, network concepts known from graph theory and um, other publications. So um, I will now review some fundamental network concepts and there are several um, references. Um, I do want to mention here that, um, I mean, I've worked on this topic for many years, al although I barely talk about it. Um, why? Because my main audience are typically biologists and they really don't care. But, <laughs> but um, um, I have, um, I actually have a, um, degree in mathematics and there's deep inside my subconscious there's a little mathematician trying to come out, you know, so. Um, <laughs> um, so in any event, the most updated version of this material is um, presented in, in, uh, in book chapters, you know, uh, but the earlier um, publicly available articles describe a lot of it. This network concept you already know. There's um, the network concept of connectivity, also known as degree. And so when you have the connectivity measure, it really depends on the size of the network, right? If you have 10,000 genes, then the, the connectivity will on average be higher than if you have only 100 genes. And therefore, we often scale the connectivity by the maximum observed connectivity. And why do we do it? Well, then we arrive at a number between 0 and 1 which facilitates comparisons, right? You can ask what is the scaled connectivity of this gene in liver tissue and compare it to the scaled connectivity in, in um, a, a different network uh, comprised of different genes in, in another condition, for example, protein-protein um, interactions and so on. So scaling the connectivity facilitates comparisons. Um, of course, Jeremy Miller mentioned several times 
um, another way of dealing with this issue, which is to rank um, the connectivity. This um, network concept was mentioned several times, which is the density, um, which is just the average adjacency. Um, but this concept I didn't mention yet. So that's a statistic called centralization. And what does it measure? Look at the graphs. So um, in the left panel, you see a, a, a small network that has a, what is known as a star topology. There's one node in the middle that connects to everything else. And um, also the nodes are not connected. And because it has a star topology, we say that the entire network has a centralization of one. In contrast, look the, at the other network, which is um, a square, really. Um, there, the centralization is zero. Why? Every node is the same. They all have the same connectivity, right? So the centralization really allows you to distinguish um, these different scenarios. And we, I mean, I don't think we ever use it in biology, but um, social scientists certainly love it, you know. They want to know, is there an actor that is sent this, uh, the, the, uh, the hub in a star topology, you know? versus another network where all people are equal, you know, and so there the centralization would be zero. Um, here's another network concept um, that has some value. Um, statistically speaking, it's just the coefficient of variation of the connectivity. And for those people who are rusty on what that means, so remember, the coefficient of variation is the square root of the variance divided by the mean value. That's all it is. And why would it matter? Well, in some networks, um, the, you have very high heterogeneity. For example, if you have a scale-free network, there are some hubs highly connected, whereas most, hubs, uh, most other nodes have low connectivity. So there's a vast variance of connectivity, and so the heterogeneity is high. And then, um, but there are other extreme situations where heterogeneity could be zero, meaning every node has the same connectivity. This is another network concept that has been used in several applications, um, certainly by people who study protein-protein uh, interaction networks. Um, so what is that? That's called the clustering coefficient. And it measures the cliqueishness of a node. So look at these um, two um, networks. And l l let's look again at um, this um, network with the star topology. Look at the node in the middle. Um, notice this node is not cliqueish. Why? Because the node has friends, meaning the direct neighbors, but they don't know each other. So if you have a social network uh, analogy, there's a person who has three friends, but for some reason he never introduces them to each other. Um, in contrast, on the right-hand side, you have um, a person that has three friends, but they know each other. So why? So this person is cliquish. He invites them over for a dinner party, and they all know each other now. <laughs> So similarly, you can measure the cliqueishness then of a gene in a network using this clustering coefficient. Um, the clustering coefficient is a number between 0 and 1 again. Yeah. Another network concept we mentioned is topologic overlap. It measures connections between um, two genes, meaning um, it measures the interconnectedness based on shared neighbors. Um, what is network significance? So imagine you have a module and you have a gene significance measure. You can just form the average gene significance of that module. And that is then the module significance. So more generally, we refer then to this average gene significance measure across all nodes in the network as the network significance. Yes? Uh, that if Yes. Then why would you use network significance instead of the correlation between the module ID gene and the trait of interest? Or are they yes. equivalent? They would be equivalent. So uh, just to repeat the question. 
So imagine you have a gene significance measure that is based on a clinical trait, for example, body mass index, and um, you're in the context of a co-expression network and you define it, a, a gene significance measure as the correlation of each gene with the trait, body weight. And then if you form the average gene significance, you in essence form the average correlation uh, across all module genes. But as an alternative, of course, you could have simply correlated the module eigengene with the trait. And um, the short answer is um, both measures would, suit, uh, would be well suited for finding genes that relate to body weight. In practice, um, you wouldn't miss much. Um, there is a subtle T going on, though, which is um, imagine you have a... Um, an unsigned network where the module is comprised of genes that can be negatively correlated. So then what could happen is that some genes have a positive correlation with body weight and others have a negative correlation with body weight. And um, if you average it, things could go terribly wrong that these, um, it averages out to zero, you know. In contrast, that, that issue would never arise when you use the module eigengene because the module eigengene is a weighted average of the genes and it is intelligent enough to flip uh, to hit genes with a minus sign if they are negatively correlated. So you avoid that problem. Um, but the other way to avoid it is when you define the gene significance measure to define it based on the absolute value of the correlation which um, could be done. But, um, you avoid all of these issues if you use a signed network. So I, that, that's yet another reason why we like signed networks, because they lead to um, modules that are comprised of positively correlated genes. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Why the Yes. Yeah, um, so the comment is um, when you um, summarize a module with the module eigengene, then we of course use the first component, let's say the, the most dominant um, singular vector. But there are other singular vectors or, um, or additional principal components. Um, and so yes, you could use them too. And some people have done that. And our R function module eigengenes actually outputs them. So you could um, or email Peter Langfelder, he certainly has a function for <laughs> producing that, you know. Um, personally, I only ever use one um, because I hope that it captures the max, um, a high proportion of the variation. All right, let me move on to another network concept. Before I describe it, let me come to a question that people occasionally ask me. So let's say we have a weighted network and we have found a hub gene. And re remember, that means that the connectivity is high for that hub gene, which means that the sum of adjacencies is high. And so here's the question people ask me. Well, is this gene a hub gene because it has high adjacencies with a few genes? Let's say it has um, there are 50 genes with which this gene has a correlation of one whereas it has a correlation of zero with all the other genes. <laughs> or is it a hub gene because this gene has moderately high correlations with many genes? Do you get the difference? Yeah. In a social network, let's say um, there's a group and the question is, are you popular because you have 10 friends that completely adore you or are you popular because you have 30 friends who kind of like you, you know? <laughs> so it is a subtle difference, you know? <laughs> now, how do you measure that difference? Well, there is a network concept for that. It's called the maximum adjacency ratio. So you would, um, in the social network case, you would calculate the person's maximum adjacency ratio. And if it is one, then there's a good chance this person is a hub because there are few, uh, there are people who completely love them and others really don't, you know. <laughs> Whereas um, the maximum adjacency ratio would be a number, let's say 0.5, if there are a lot of people who kind of like you, you know. And um, here, 
that's how it is defined. It's just a, a ratio um, between the squares of the adjacencies and the unsquared sum of adjacencies. And it, the name um, reflects that if the adjacencies take on only their maximum value, one, or otherwise zero, then the maximum adjacency ratio is one. Because, yeah. All connections take on the maximum adjacency, which is one. Yeah. All right. So why did I go through this exercise of um, reviewing network concepts? Well, because when people, dis coming back, these are useful for describing networks, network topology. And when we compare two networks, a network based on Alzheimer disease subject, another network based on controls, we can use all of these statistics. So when we have any of these network concepts in one reference set, for example, AD subjects versus a test set, the control um, um, subject, we just can form the difference, right? We can say um, the difference in connectivity, for example. So we, um, or the difference in density, or the difference in clustering coefficients. So um, to flesh that out, for the ith gene, you can say what is the difference in the clustering coefficients between these two networks. Um, now I mention that often one is not so much interested in individual genes, um, although you could be. You could say which gene has a high cliqueishness in one network but not in the other. But often we are um, rather interested in what I call global statistics that involve averaging, right? You can say what is the difference in the mean clustering coefficient in network one versus that in the second network? or the mean connectivity, or, or, mean, or the mean KME or density. And if you're interested in these global statistics, then fortunately um, you can draw on the module preservation function, which I already mentioned to you yesterday, um, because it outputs that. Remember when I went through the tutorial, I skipped a lot of stuff. I just went straight to the plot. <laughs> Um, but for some of you who really want to delve into it, I just tell you that um, this function calculates, for example, the mean clustering coefficient in your reference network and it calculates the mean clustering coefficient in your test network and then also it uses the permutation test. Remember there's a permutation test so you can literally get p-values. Um, maybe that's another thing I forgot to mention to you. Um, the module preservation function outputs these Z statistics that we report in papers, so let's say Z summary and so on. Why, why do we report Z statistics? Well, because the p-values are way too significant. You know? The, the p-values are 10 to the minus 300 or so, absurdly significant. Having said this, if you don't want Z statistics, the function does output p-values, you know, so there's an, a list component called p-values and if you want to have those, you get them. You know? So just be aware of it that um, this can be obtained with the module preservation function and if you want to know details, email Peter Langfelder or me. Um, I, in that, um, now this slide was all about differences but of course the flip side of difference is a, a similarity and I mentioned to you that one way to relate network concepts between two re uh, networks is to just correlate them, right? You can form the correlation between the connectivity in the reference network and the test network, but you can also correlate the clustering coefficients between these networks and so on. Um, finally, I mention um, if you really want to calculate these fundamental network concepts I mentioned, maximum adjacency ratio, clustering coefficient, blah, density, blah, blah, blah. You can use the R function fundamental network concepts which uh, takes as input an adjacency matrix and optionally a gene significance measure. So you don't, um, so um, notice um, the default value for the gene significance measure is null, you don't have to input it. And if you use that, then you get a lot of output um, uh, that I mentioned. 
There are other R functions. Um, yeah. Yes, so um, an example of a gene significance measure in the context of the mouse data is just the correlation between each gene and the mouse body weight. But you know, let me come to a social network analogy, you know. Um, let's say you um, measure, uh, you have a high school and then um, you want to assign a measure of node significance to each student. And one way to do it is to take their grade point average, you know. <laughs> and then you could ask a question. Let's say you have a sub-network comprised of all the students in the science club. That's your network. And you can ask the question, are hubs in that network, do they have a high grade point average? So you can ca calculate the hub gene significance, you know. And you could, you could say, well, um, people in the um, science club there the hub gene significance is high, let's say one or two, whereas in the um, clique of um, um, football players, the hubs tend to have low um, uh, uh, grade point averages. <laughs> so there the hub gene significance would be lower. I hope I don't offend people, but uh, it's, it's a type of question you can uh, address, you know, using these concepts. Yeah. Um, there are some papers where people calculated these statistics, you know. Um, but again, remember why I showed you the um, power studies. The truth is um, when you f do this differential network analysis com where you compare different network concepts, it is good to have a larger sample size. Yeah. Um, there is another R function which is called network concepts and that outputs um, network concepts when you have a gene expression data set. Remember this function, fundamental network concept, takes as input an adjacency matrix, meaning you can apply it to protein-protein interaction networks, any network that you can think of. Really any matrix whose entries lie between 0 and 1, any similarity matrix. Um, However, um, if you have a correlation network, then you can use the function network concepts because it outputs, it then automatically calculates a weighted network, for example, if you say I want the network type, for example, signed or unsigned and a different threshold. And so it outputs these results. So um, let me now um, come to data analysis strategies, um, which is single network analysis versus differential network analysis. Um, I hope you learned that 95% of applications involve single network analysis. So what is that? So the goals of single network analysis is to find modules or pathways or, and, um, that relate to your trait of interest or to find the hub genes in it. And so in a single network analysis, you may st uh, start out with female liver tissue, find modules, and then you take validation data sets, other mouse crosses, and you validate that the modules exist in these other data sets. And you can use the module preservation function and so on. So this is really um, the data analysis strategies that is most widely used. Um, yes? Other than the module Yes, uh, yes, thank you for asking. Yes, that's a good question. So let's say we are in single network analysis and we want to actually argue that the modules that we have found are stable. And that is a very common reviewer comment. You know, they say, well, you used 50 arrays, convince me the module is stable. And um, we actually have very, uh, there's a very valuable um, software tutorial that I think we don't highlight enough that carries out stability analysis. It's, a, uh, it's a really tremendously valuable. And it does the following. It basically bootstraps the data, or optionally, it r uh, randomly removes a third of the data. You know? That's what I like to do. So I take my original data set, I randomly remove a third of the data, and reconstruct everything, the adjacency matrix, the cluster tree, the, um, the branch cutting. And then I get an output, the modules. I do that 200 times. 
And now you have the challenge, how do you aggregate the information? And so we have a cluster tree where you see all the module assignments and it's a very convincing plot if it's true that the module is highly stable. You will find that, wow, this um, this blue module can be found in any of these iterations, you know. And so um, search for it. it um, we have a web page for um, an article by Peter Langfelder uh, which is called Fast R Functions and that's where you find it, but otherwise email me. And so that does stability, uh, um, that carries that out. But I also mentioned the module preservation function also outputs what we call quality statistics. That's actually one list component. There's a host of statistics based on permutation tests where you can say um, my module has high quality. You know? So between these two, two tools, I ho hopefully you can argue that the module is stable. But if it isn't stable, don't lie, you know, then <laughs> get additional data and do consensus module analysis, right? Get a second data set and get stable results. You know. Yes? Is removing one third of the data an accepted bootstrapping strategy? I mean, not, why not bootstrap on 50% of the data because that is... Yeah, so uh, I have this discussion a lot. I mean, many people actually prefer bootstrapping, really. But um, I always try to hone in on the negative. So I, I literally remove a third. And why? Because I then can say, if you do something statistically crazy, which is reduce your own power, why would you do it? But I just like to do it to say, well, even then I find it, you know. It's just a very powerful way of arguing that there's a signal. But there's a side benefit to it, which is sometimes you are unlucky or you were un um, in the sense that there are some severe outliers. And so by, rem by removing a third, there's a good chance that in some iterations you really removed these outliers. And then you wouldn't be able to find your module, right, <laughs> due to these severe outliers. And so that's perhaps a better rationale. Yeah. All right, let me um, resume then this, um, the differential network analysis. So here the, the emphasis is on finding differences in topology. And that's why I went through this exercise of um, introducing network concepts. So let's say you really do have two networks and um, on the one hand, you can highlight, of course, genes that are differentially expressed. But um, if you want to find what we call differentially wired genes, look there, here in one network, you see these green connections that you don't see in the other network. Or here are red connections that you don't see in this network. So you want to find edges that are differentially wired. And so here's an example that was carried out by Tova Fuller um, on these um, mouse data. So here um, Tova constructed two networks, one based on the 30 leanest mice and the second network based on the 30 heaviest mice. So she split these or original 135 female liver tissues into two extreme sets and constructed a network based on the lean mice and the ob obese mice. And then when you have these two groups, you certainly want to calculate the student t-test, right? To find which genes are differentially expressed between lean and um, obese mice. But also you can calculate what we call this diff k statistic. That's the difference between the scaled connectivity in the first and the second data set. And then do, um, to flesh that out, remember how I said uh, um, we can calculate the uh, scaled connectivity, um, de defined as connectivity divided by the max connectivity in the first network and the second network. And then what you see is you can form this difference in connectivity. Now, um, when you have that, you can plot on the x-axis the difference in connectivity for each gene and on the y-axis the student t-test of differential expression. And you can um, introduce these sectors, right? I mean, you have certain thresholds. So um, these thresholds you can choose in a variety of ways. For example, for the student t-test statistic, you can choose it based on a p-value. For example, um, re remember th around 2 and minus 2 corresponds to a 
threshold of roughly 0.05. Um, but for the differential connectivity, you would want to do a permutation test, right? And um, to, f to um, arrive at thresholds where after you permute the mice so that, um, that both groups are comparable, you can um, recreate this plot and see where do the genes fall, you know? So after I per permuted these mouse labels, notice that all genes fall into this central s sector, meaning these genes are not differentially expressed and they are not differentially connected. Why? Because the mice are comparable. But um, um, noting that, you can see in the original um, analysis, there are some sectors that are comprised of genes that are highly overexpressed in obese mice and they are highly connected in obese mice, but not in lean mice. And similarly, you can look at the opposite. There are some genes that are highly connected in the obese mice, but they are underexpressed. And so these different sectors have different meanings. And so you can label then these sectors. And incidentally here, the points are colored by module color. In, um, and so then you can um, ask, well, how significant is it that there are so many genes in sector 3 compared to the permuted version? And you get permutation p-values. And you say, wow, there's really high enrichment. And then um, you can do a functional analysis and just use these tools that um, we reviewed, for example, David Ease or user list enrichment, and ask, so what's known about these genes in these sectors? And um, just to give you some insight, so we find extracellular region genes, epidermal growth factor related genes, and so on. And um, there's, uh, so EGF was found to be increased in obese mice, and so you could argue that what was found was reasonable, you know. So it gives you, um, also there are other sectors, you can do functional enrichment analyses and uh, related to the literature. And um, so I refer you to Tova Fuller's paper, you know. But just to wrap things um, up at this point, so um, we covered a lot of topics today. Um, if applicable, I, I feel you should always report the findings from a standard differential expression analysis. Don't just give the reader modules, really give them a list of genes that are important. Now, if you want to describe network topology, um, there's a host of network concepts out there. Um, however, I find relatively few people use it, you know. How many nature papers have you read where people say, oh, this gene has a high clustering coefficient in obese mice, but not in lean mice, you know. So, <laughs> although the tools are available, they, they haven't been widely adapted, and I feel there's, um, it is a little bit of a um, scientific question whether these topological statistics matter in biology. And um, I think um, the, the, op the question is still unanswered. And it may reflect r the relatively low sample sizes we have and the relatively large amount of noise in the data. Because when you calculate these statistics, for example, the centralization, um, this is in principle a non-robust statistic, you know, and so, all right. Um, I also um, feel that the best way and the most biologically most meaningful way of comparing two networks is at the level of modules. Which module can only be found here and not here? And to carry out that analysis, um, you can certainly use the module preservation function which is why we spend a lot of time on it. You know. And so um, I acknowledge again Tova Fuller and John Dong and Peter Langfelder who have worked um, on the, all of these topics and um, members of the Jake Lucis lab who generated the data. Thank you. Yeah. Uh,